Summary of Flying High JetBlue founder and CEO David Nealman's rules for beating the competition, even in the world's most turbulent industry. By James Winbrandt. Taking off. On February 11, 2000, at exactly 8.55 a.m., onlookers cheered as the first JetBlue aircraft pushed back from JFK's Terminal 6 for the airline's inaugural flight to Fort Lauderdale. That maiden voyage marked JetBlue's entry into one of the world's most competitive businesses. It was quite an accomplishment for founder David Nealman, a low-key religious man whose attention deficit disorder once led him to doubt that he'd ever be able to hold a decent job. Nealman was born in Brazil in October 1959, the second child in a family that eventually had four boys and three girls. His father, a Salt Lake City, Utah, native, served as the Latin America Bureau Chief for United Press International. The family, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, eventually returned to Salt Lake City. David Nealman struggled academically at Salt Lake's Brighton High School. He had difficulty sitting down to read an entire book, and recalls wondering how he would ever succeed in life if he were unable to read and write. Still, he managed to graduate. In 1977, he enrolled at the University of Utah, specializing in accounting, which suited him somewhat better than less numerical pursuits. He left college after his freshman year to serve as a missionary in keeping with the Mormon belief that members must spread their faith. Nealman served in Brazil, where he baptized more than 200 converts. In 1980, Nealman returned to Utah and married his college sweetheart, Vicky Vrains. Their first child, Ashley, was born a year later, and Nealman returned to his accounting studies at the university. His first entrepreneurial venture in college, a travel agency that earned $6 million a year, failed almost overnight when the airline he relied upon went out of business. Despite that setback, Nealman soon blazed new entrepreneurial trails in the travel business, quickly proving that he had learned his lessons well. Morris Air in 1984, June Morris, owner of Morris Travel, then Utah's largest travel agency, invited Nealman to come to work for her. She recognized his creative talents and basically left him alone to do what he wanted. It was the perfect springboard for his talents. The first obstacle Nealman encountered at Morris was a lack of available discount air seats to Hawaii. He flew to the islands to try to work out a deal with Ul Wells, a vice president of Hawaiian Airlines. Wells Company had an old DC-8 that was idle one day a week, so he agreed to fly the plane to Salt Lake City on Thursdays, and fly it back to Honolulu on Friday mornings. Nealman made it his personal mission to ensure that none of its 204 seats flew empty. When the airline later offered to base the DC-8 permanently in Salt Lake, Nealman launched Morris Air. By 1989, the company moved into new headquarters with room for a 400-person telephone reservation center. Three years later, it became an official airline, instead of a charter operation. By 1993, Morris Air operated flights across the western U.S., using a fleet of 23 Boeing 737 aircraft. When he sold the company to Southwest Airlines' Herb Kelleher for $129 million, Nealman made $25 million in Southwest stock, but he didn't last long on Southwest's executive team. Following his participation in WestJet, which inaugurated service to Calgary, Vancouver, and other Canadian cities in 1996, he was ready for another bold aviation venture, JetBlue. Flying Blue Skies Nealman's push for JetBlue began with a 1997 meeting at a Salt Lake coffee shop with his friend. Investment guru Michael Lazarus of the Western Presidio firm, which had supported Morris Air. Lazarus was initially skeptical, but Nealman's comprehensive grasp of the aviation business quickly persuaded him. Next Nealman had to recruit an executive operations team. His prize hire was industry veteran David Barger, who became president and COO of JetBlue. Nealman's vision was to bring humanity back to air travel, and he made every deceit scion with that goal in mind yet skepticism greeted his new venture. When he shook hands with potential investors and pitched his idea, their reaction was often blatant doubt or blank stares. Many upstart airlines had gone out of business, so investors asked Nealman why he thought his would fare any better. At first, Nealman didn't even have a name for the new airline. 
he kept coming back to the word blue, but since the word is in widespread common use, it couldn't be trademarked. That led to the alternative, JetBlue. The company selected New York's JFK International Airport as its home base because it was located close to 5 million travelers, yet it lacked domestic service. When the first JetBlue aircraft took off from JFK on February 11, 2000, it marked the culmination of Neilman's dream and a new era in low-cost aviation. The airline emphasized a well-trained staff of crew members, as employees were called. The crew members were well compensated yet non-union, befitting Neilman's negative feelings about unions. Seeking to restore entertainment value to air travel, JetBlue offered Live TV Sir Vice with monitors installed in seatbacks. The company welcomed new technology, flying the Airbus A320 and using e-ticketing to reduce distribution costs. From the beginning, JetBlue was profitable, selling an average of more than 70% of available seats. Neilman's Suite 14 Neilman's 14 rules for business success can be applied to any endeavor. Although they are based on common sense, few business leaders actually follow them. The rules are 1. Follow your passion because his attention deficit disorder prevented him from focusing on anything that fell short of being all-consuming, Neilman instinctively only pursued ideas that interested him passionately. He still follows his passions. 2. Be creative, E. Neilman habitually thinks outside the box. Others marvel at his ability to conceive new ideas continually. While some of his brainstorms may not work out, his ability to see a situation from a new perspective is key to his success. 3. Study the best, he as creative as he is, Neilman discovered the advantage of emulat in others. He believes in gathering wisdom from the leaders in any field, learns from others and agrees that great organizations depend on great teams. 4. Always be ready to move on, he don't hold on to your successes. The death grip mentality is ultimately self-defeating. Change is positive, so don't hesitate to shake up your circumstances in pursuit of your dreams. 5. Do things better, not just differently, is strive continually to find more effective ways to meet the market's demands. Business success is simple, just combine the best product with the lowest price. Create a better mousetrap. Neilman avoided his com, petitus market strengths and tested their weaknesses. When other carriers lacked customer care, his airline offered good service. For example, his competitors failed to fly on time, so he focused on using airports that had only minimal delays. 6. Whenever possible, be well capitalized, you need a cash cushion to ride out economic ups and downs. Don't be afraid to demand more startup money than you need. Then you can operate comfortably and improve your survival chances. 7. Take good care of your people, E. Neilman touts his JetBlue crew members as the primary reason for the airline's achievements. He believes a service business suck, seeds or fails based on its frontline employees and refers to a customer's interac, tie on with a frontline service person as a moment of truth. Such interactions can have profound effects on your business. So, share the wealth and offer excellent working conditions. 8. Demonstrate respect for your customers. Neilman designed every aspect of a customer's interaction with the company to demonstrate and reinforce its respect for its customers. This paid off handsomely, given that approximately 60% of its new customers heard about the airline through word of mouth. 9. Admit mistakes early, it don't let your mistakes slow you down, admit them promptly. This is critical. Any path includes some stumbling, but if you recognize an error quickly, you can take proactive steps to protect your customer relationships. 10. Mind the details, E. Neilman doesn't like to become bogged down in details, but he recognizes that little things are important. He hires managers who effectively handle the details. For example, at JetBlue the first piece of luggage must be on the carousel within 10 minutes of a flight's arrival, and the last piece must be there within 20-minute utes. If not, management will hear about it. 11. Save money without appearing cheap, or try to economize without letting it show. Neilman's frugality is legendary. He once lived for two years on $1,700 as a missionary in Brazil. Even while he prepared to launch JetBlue, the best-funded startup in aviation history, he stayed at a friend's apartment when he had to be in Manhattan rather than paying for a hotel room. 
12. Fully exploit technology in Eelman commanded his troops to automate everything. Every JetBlue ticket is issued electronically. The firm uses technology to allow reservation agents to work from their homes. This automated reservation system gives JetBlue the lowest distribution costs in the industry. 13. Garner attention. JetBlue operates a savvy marketing machine that has placed Neilman in just about every newspaper and magazine in the U.S. Its successful self-promotion generates crucial word of mouth and free media attention. 14. Hold on to your core values. Neilman was raised with a strong religious faith. He defined JetBlue's core values very early in the company's history. He strongly believes that adhering to your values makes for happier customers, more effective employees and, ultimately, greater prosperity. A look ahead. JetBlue was virtually a billion-dollar-a-year company by its third year of operation. At the beginning of 2004, it had 55 aircraft operating 220 flights daily. In many ways, Delta's launch of Song and United's bid with TED were a direct result of JetBlue's success. Given such a boom in budget carriers, how will the airline industry evolve? Historically, major airlines have a poor track record when it comes to operating low-cost carriers. Investor Warren Buffett calls it the toughest business ever. If you go back to the time of Kitty Hawk, Net, the airline transport business in the United States has made no money, says Buffett, who likes to say that the Wright brothers' first flight was, one small step for mankind, and one huge step backwards for capitalism. Certainly the airline industry has remained challenged overall since September 11, 2001, despite the $10 billion in grants and loans from the federal government. Clearly, the government does not want major carriers to fail. After all, the airline sector accounts for 8% of the U.S. gross domestic product. JetBlue's impact on the future of air travel is clear. Its seatback satellite television service challenged the industry to provide better entertainment. Several discount airlines followed suit. Many airlines copy JetBlue's decision to serve only beverages and small snacks. Many passengers are happy to bring their own meals aboard and save money on their tickets. For its part, JetBlue would like to expand to Mexico, Canada, and the Caribbean, although Neilman has no interest in expanding to far-flung destinations such as Europe or the Far East, where competition is stiffer and larger aircraft are required. Certainly, JetBlue has trained consumers to expect a fairly high level of customer service for a low fare. By 2011, Neilman estimates that JetBlue will have 290 airplanes flying from 50 to 60 different cities. Eventually, it plans to employ some 30,000 people. Neilman is commit, Ted, to the notion that even as JetBlue takes on mammoth proportions, it will never forget that its success ultimately hinges on that individual moment of truth when a crewman but interacts with a customer. If that transaction and others like it go well, the airline can comfortably expect to enjoy excellent weather for flying.